Dr. Nasser Med. In today's topic, we're going to talk about pulmonary embolism. We're going to first define pulmonary embolism, then we're going to talk about the pathogenesis of this disease, then we're going to talk about classification and the presentation of pulmonary embolism, and then we're going to end up our video talking about how to diagnose these patients and how to treat them. Now, what makes pulmonary embolism so important? First, it is a very common disease. The incidence of pulmonary embolism has been increasing uh, gradually over the last 10 years thanks to the development of all this medical imaging. And second thing is that it is extremely fatal, especially in its severe form. And deaths from pulmonary embolism um, has been estimated to be around 100,000 annually in the United States only. However, what makes it extremely important is that you can make the difference Diagnosing pulmonary embolism early on and treating them accordingly can make significant difference in the life of these patients. And by doing that, you can bring the um, mortality rate significantly down, uh, especially with treating them early on. Let's start first our presentation by defining pulmonary embolism. What exactly pulmonary embolism is? Basically, it's, it's a term that is used to define any obstruction of the pulmonary artery by a material that originated somewhere else in the body. This material could be made of, for example, fat. And um, in the case of fat embolism, um, it's commonly seen in patients who underwent a surgery of their broken bone. And uh, these patients, uh, in addition to the classical symptoms of pulmonary embolism, they can present with some neurological symptoms as well as petechial rash. Uh, second one being air embolism. Basically, patients who are divers and they go escalate rapidly from a deep sea level to the surface uh, sea level that can precipitate air embolism. Or maybe patients who, who underwent a central venous catheter placement that can also precipitate um, air embolism as well. The third being amniotic fluid embolism, basically pregnant patients who just has uh, her delivery or is undergoing delivery um, can um, have amniotic fluid embolism as well. Or this embolism can be made of bacteria. In this case, we call it septic embolism. However, the most common form of embolism or the most uh, common pulmonary embolism is made of a thrombus. And that's the main focus of our presentation today. Now, this thrombus can come from any vein in your body. However, the most common site is the proximal lower extremity. Around 85% of pulmonary embolism comes from a D-vein thrombosis of the proximal lower extremity. Now, when I say proximal lower extremity, I mean the femoral veins or the iliac veins or the popliteal veins. Um, however, the distal lower uh, extremity veins are less likely to cause uh, pulmonary embolism. Reason is, is that the distal DVTs, they're likely, uh, they are a lot more likely they're going to dissolve by themselves. And um, it's also because the distal veins are rich in those venous valves that will eventually prevent the blood clot from reaching all the way to the heart and to the lungs. Now, this is 85% uh, of the cases. A DVT, it came from a DVT of the proximal lower extremity. 15% of the cases comes from either the upper extremity, such as in patients with uh, cath IV catheter or from subclavian vein or from pelvic veins, and that's commonly seen in pregnant patients. Now, moving on, and then let's, let's go through our first route of this blood clot from the, um, the proximal lower extremity all the way how it, and how it reaches to the lung. First, you can see here this is the patient with a deep vein thrombosis of the right lower extremity, mainly the proximal side. Let's say this is, could be the femoral vein. And uh, normally the symptoms, as you know, of DVT is edema, swelling, and redness of the leg. Now this blood clot can uh, eventually dislodge or break off from its place and travel through the inferior vena cava into the right ventricle. Once it's in the right ventricle, the right ventricle will pump it out 
through these pulmonary trunks and then from the pulmonary trunks it will eventually reach to the uh, distal pulmonary arteries and it will uh, obstruct some of these pulmonary arteries there. And as you can see here, I drew a blood, small blood clot and then distal to this blood clot, you see this red area where I'm indicating that this is an area where the blood supply uh, to, to it is lost and basically what we call infraction. Um, now moving on, talking about the pathogenesis of pulmonary embolism. And when, when you say pathogenesis of pulmonary embolism, we're basically talking about the pathogenesis of the formation of blood clots. And this is uh, uh, beautifully defined by the varicose triad. The varicose triad is basically describing the environment in which the blood clot is more likely it's going to form. And this is composed of three main factors. One is venous stasis. What we mean by venous stasis is that this... Um, when, when the patient is immobile or when the patient is obese or let's say when the patient is having a, a congestive heart failure, their venous blood flow is extremely slow and that will um, eventually promote the formation of a blood clot. The second factor is endothelial injury, basically patient with um, surgery, recent surgery or trauma uh, or a previous DVT that propagates um, that can also break off or like disrupt the inner layer of the blood vessel, the endothelial layer, and that can precipitate um, the blood clot formation as well. The third uh, part of the varicose triad is hypercoagulability state. Basically, any patient who, uh, who is on um, oral contraceptives or hormonal replacement therapy, or patients who uh, have cancer, or patients uh, who have um, one of those inherited hypercoagulability disorders, such as factor V laden, protein C and S. Um, these patients, their body is in a, um, is more uh, prone to develop clots than the normal patients. Now. Moving on, talking about the risk factors of pulmonary embolism. What exactly are the risk factors for pulmonary embolism? I'd like to divide them into two. One is inherited and one is acquired. Inherited risk factors are the ones that I talked about. It's basically the inherited uh, diseases such as factor V laden, antithrombin deficiency, protein CNS, and the other type is acquired. And I'd like to subdivide the acquired risk factors into two. One is provoked, one is unprovoked. And I'm sure you've heard about provoked and unprovoked pulmonary embolism before. Basically, when we talk about provoked pulmonary embolism, what we mean by that is that the patient had some sort of environmental risk factor uh, recently in his life that kind of precipitated this pulmonary embolism. These environmental risk factor could be um, in immobility or recent travel or patient underwent uh, surgery lately or the patient started a hormonal replacement therapy recently. Um, these kind of factors can precipitate uh, the blood clot formation and um, the provoked pulmonary embolism, they're, uh, they're, once these env environmental risk factors are controlled, then the patient will no longer be uh, at risk of pulmonary embolism. However, on the other side, the unprovoked pulmonary embolism is when there is non-environmental risk factors. And what I mean by that is that there is no strong risk factor that you can identify that could have precipitated this clot formation. And um, mainly this could be um, idiopathic. It means there, there is no a risk, like a, a prominent reason in, that you could identify that could have caused the pulmonary embolism, or it could be uh, risk factors that you um, cannot control, such as male sex, old age, etc. And that's it for the pathogenesis of pulmonary embolism. There are several ways to classify pulmonary embolism. And one of the ways is based on the hemodynamic stability as well as the presence or absence of right heart strain. When, when I say hemodynamically unstable pulmonary embolism, well, what I mean by that is that upon the presentation of this patient, 
the patient had a blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of below 90, or the patient had a drop of more than 40 millimeter mercury of blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, comparing to his baseline. And that blood, uh, decrease in blood pressure has to last more than 15 minutes, and it should not be explained by any other pathology, such as sepsis of my, or myocardial fraction, etc. Now, if the pulmonary embolism is associated with hemodynamically instability, as well as the presence of right heart strain, we classify this as a massive uh, or high-risk pulmonary embolism. And massive pulmonary embolism is very fatal. Patient can die within the first two hours of presentation. Now, also the massive pulmonary embolism has a different way to diagnose and treat as uh, comparing to the other two types. Now, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, however, there is a right heart strain, we classified it as intermediate risk or submassive pulmonary embolism. And however, if there is no right heart strain and the patient is hemodynamically stable, we classify this as a low risk. Now, there is other ways to classify pulmonary embolism. Uh, sometimes you can classify it based on the anatomy of where this blood clot is located. Uh, it could be saddle embolism, lobar, or segmental. You can also classify it based on the time of the presentation of the symptoms. If the symptoms happen acutely, um, then we call it acute pulmonary embolism, basically within minutes to hours. If it's um, if the symptoms started gradually over the years it started to develop, then we call it chronic pulmonary embolism. And anything, anything in between, basically weeks to months, we call it subacute. Now moving on, talking uh, about the sign and symptoms of pulmonary embolism. I like to divide it based on the mechanism um, of, of action for, um, for each one of those. So. As I mentioned earlier, when the blood clot obstructs the pulmonary artery, uh, there will be a loss of blood flow of the segment of the lung distal to that pulmonary artery. And that's what we call infraction. Now, once an infraction happens, the body will respond with an inflammatory reaction. And this inflammatory reaction can cause an inflammation of the pleural layer surrounding this infracted uh, segment of the lung and that's why the patient will present with pleuritic chest pain, chest pain that comes with upon inhalation or taking a deep breath. It can also, uh, the patient can also present with cough and sometimes, but very rarely, hemoptysis, coughing up blood. The reason this is a rare symptom is because um, hemoptysis um, is, is going to be present only when the infraction is so severe. However, lung tissue is one of the tissues that is rarely going to get severely infracted. Main reason is that because it has a dual blood supply. And because of this inflammatory response, the patient will come with tachycardia upon presentation. Now, once the, the, the blood clot obstructs the pulmonary artery, there will be a VQ mismatch, a ventilation to perfusion mismatch. Basically, the, the blood clots will prevent the, the perfusion of the blood or the arterial blood to, uh, to, 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 to pass through that blood clot. And eventually, there will be uh, too much ventilation but very low perfusion. Um, and that will cause this VQ mismatch. And eventually, the distal tissues will receive less oxygen and that's why the patient will present with hypoxemia and will present with shortness of breath and as a response the body will try to hyperventilate in order to compensate for this low oxygen and that's why the patient will present with tachypnea and hypoxia and we take uh, arterial blood gas on these patients because they're hyperventilating they're mainly going to present with respiratory alkalosis because as you hyperventilate, you're excreting all the CO2 out of your uh, blood and that will uh, cause um, significant increase in the pH of the blood and alkalosis. And it will also cause an, uh, a significant increase in the AA gradient, the alveolar arterial gradient, as 
The reason is because you, um, you have this perfusion deficit um, in the pulmonary artery. Now, because of this hypoxia, or once this hypoxia becomes severe, um, eventually the pulmonary arteries will vasoconstrict as a response, and that will cause pulmonary hypertension, increasing the blood pressure in those pulmonary arteries. And because of that, the valves, the pulmonary valves, will have a hard time closing up and that will lead to a loud P2 when you auscultate these patients. Now, once, if this pulmonary hypertension has become severe enough, the, the right ventricle will have a hard time pumping blood through that vasoconstricted blood vessel. So eventually the right ventricle will get tired and fatigued and that can lead to a right heart failure symptoms. And uh, if you remember, right heart failure symptoms composed of JVD, uh, leg swelling, and abdominal distension that the patient can uh, present with. And that's an, one indication that the pulmonary uh, embolism is severe. Now, Moving on, if you, if you suspect a pulmonary embolism and you take a chest x-ray on these patients, 90% of the times the chest x-ray will be normal. However, if the pulmonary embolism is so severe, it, will, you can, it can present with a Wester mark sign, basically a loss of the vascular marking distal to the area of obstruction. Uh, it, it can also present with a Hampton, sign, Hampton hump. Uh, basically, um, uh, an, an, an infiltrate that's in the shape of wedge, wedge-shaped infiltrate, and that's indicative of the area of infraction. And um, because this patient has tachycardia, you will automatically get an EKG. And on the, under the EKG, you will see non-specific changes and patients with pulmonary embolism. And you will not see these ST changes or any signs of uh, MI that will, uh, and that MI or any other cardiac um, causes will be ruled out for that EKG. Now, moving on, and we're gonna talk about the diagnostic workup. When you get a patient with pulmonary embolism, or you, you suspect pulmonary embolism, um, in this patient, what do you do? You first get Wells criteria. Wells criteria will give you a number, and based on that number, you will categorize them whether they're low suspicion, moderate suspicion, or high suspicion that it is pulmonary embolism. If you have a high suspicion of pulmonary embolism, you and they have a low risk of um, bleeding, then you can go ahead and treat these patients immediately. And um, however, if the suspicion is a moderate, somewhere in between, then you can go ahead and start with uh, ordering imaging. And the, of course, the, the imaging of choice for pulmonary embolism is CT angiogram. However, there is contraindication in which some certain patients, they cannot get uh, CT angiogram. And, um, these patients could be uh, pregnant patients. The reason is CT has a high amount of radiation that can harm the baby. So in this case, instead of CT angiogram, you will go with a VQ scan. VQ scan is also indicated instead of CT angio in patients with uh, acute kidney injury or increasing creatinine uh, due to the, this contrast that you inject uh, during the CT angio can uh, harm the kidney and causes worsening of um, the kidney function. And lastly, if you have a low suspicion of uh, pulmonary embolism, you can get D-dimer just to rule out pulmonary embolism because if D-dimer is negative, then you rule out pul pulmonary embolism. However, if D-dimer is positive, then that um, does not rule in pulmonary embolism and neither does it rule it out. And that once D-dimer is positive, then that, need, that means that you need um, a more detailed um, test or detailed images such as CT angio. Reason is that D-dimer is nonspecific is because it's an acute phase reactant. In any inflammation or any uh, uh, reaction in the body can cause an elevation of D-dimer. That's why it's not very specific. Now, now once um, 
Now, however, there is a situation where if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, at that moment, you don't have the time to, um, to uh, wait for the CT angio or VQ scan because those images take time. In this case, you can go ahead and order an echocardiogram or a venous ultrasound that can ra be rapidly done on the bedside and can give you the diagnosis immediately. Now, moving on and talking about the treatment of pulmonary embolism. Once you get a patient of, with, 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 with confirmed pulmonary embolism, what you need to do first is to stabilize the patient. If the patient has a, a hypotension, then you give them a fluids and vasopressors as needed. And if the patient is um, um, hypoxic, then you supply them with, with oxygen um, until they're stabilized. Now, after that, you go ahead and start with um, anticoagulation therapy. Mainly, the main therapy is heparin and warfarin bridge. You start with both of them, and then, however, you stop heparin five to seven days af uh, after uh, initiation of heparin, or uh, when the INR becomes two to three. Um, whichever one of those is longer, then you go with it. Um, However, if the patient is unstable, then um, it, it is indicated to give uh, TPA, thrombolytic therapy, as these patients are unstable and need something that can act rapidly on the blood clots. However, if TPA is, contra if TPA is contraindicated, such as a patient who have a high risk of bleeding, then you can um, go undergo a surgical embolectomy. However, that is very uh, uh, rarely done. Now moving on, uh, talking a little bit about situation in where heparin is contraindicated, basically in patients with heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia or severe allergy to heparin, in that case you can give one of the NOAX medications such as the factor 10 inhibitors or antithrombin uh, medications. Um, and however, if there is a contraindication uh, to warfarin, on the other hand, such as pregnant patients, um, then you can give low molecular weight heparin instead. Now, uh, finally, I'm going to end up this uh, uh, presentation by talking about the IVC filter. When is IVC filter indicated? Basically, when a patient has a high risk of bleeding or the patient had a recent neuro or eye surgery, then these patients cannot uh, be given uh, any of the anticoagulation uh, medications due to the high risk of bleeding and, and in that case then we put them on IVC filter until uh, there is no more risk of bleeding then this IVC filter can be taken off and the patient will be put back on the anticoagulation as soon as it is indicated. Um, that is it for pulmonary embolism. So to summarize this video, we talked about the importance of pulmonary embolism and how it's important to treat pulmonary embolism immediately as soon as you suspect it. And then we also talked about how pulmonary embolism most likely originated from a deep vein thrombosis of the proximal lower extremity. Then we talked about the pathogenesis of this disease and how it uh, uh, it is uh, mainly the pathogens of clot formation, summarized by the varicose triad. Then we moved on and talked about the cast classification of pulmonary embolism, massive, submassive, and low risk, and then how that differs or changes the treatment and diagnostic workup based on what class you're at. And then we also talked about the clinical sign and symptoms of pulmonary embolism based on the mechanism of uh, action. And then we also talked about the diagnostic workup, how you start with the Wells criteria, and based on your suspicion, you categorize it uh, to high, medium, or low, and what you need to do based on your suspicion. And then we ended up talking about the treatment. You stabilize, stabilize the patient first, then you anticoagulate. Unless, there is, unless they are unstable, then you go ahead and, um, move and start the TPA thrombolytic therapy. And then we uh, finished with talking about the IVC filter um, indications and whether or wh in what situation heparin and warfarin are contraindicated. So that is it for today's video.
Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching.